topic. I'm not here because I'm a native English speaker. I'm here because I was interested in the topic, and I had uh, several discussions about China already as, as in my life as a journalist. Uh, I'm actually a member of the editorial board of Handelszeitung, one of the biggest economics uh, weekly here in Switzerland. Then I'm an editor-in-chief of a magazine called Millionaire that is about investing for people who have a little bit more money. And then I wrote a book about uh, personal finance uh, that uh, is now already in the third edition. The first two editions were sold out, so now just in the spring this was released, the third edition. So. That's to me, and now to the most important people here, to the panelists. We have three panelists here that made it physically to the place, and one you see on the screen. I would uh, uh, say, please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Alice. Um, I'm Chinese. I run, a, um, I run two portfolios. One is a China portfolio, and one is an Asia-Pacific portfolio for Quero Capital. Um, Ingo von Mongstein was 30 years with McKinsey, 10 of those years in China, mainland China, serving the government Chinese companies, uh, so being really in the machine room, and have a, um, a professorship at Tsinghua University. We're running a China Research Fund in Shanghai, China Research House in, Chang in China, in a partnership with ACATIS, and we have a China on Asian Fund. Uh, my name is Richard Adams. Um, I work for American Century Investments. I'm based in London, so I work with clients across the EMEA region. I also work very closely with our investment teams, uh, in particular our emerging markets equity team based in the US. I hope uh, you can hear me. Uh, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry I could not be there in person. I remember doing this event uh, a few years back in person, so it's, it's a bit uh, unfortunate. Uh, but, uh, yeah, just to introduce myself, I'm Projit Chatterjee. I am a senior equity specialist with UBS, and I've worked with UBS for 25 years across three locations. Uh, the last uh, nearly 15 years I've been in Singapore uh, working as uh, equity specialist in the emerging markets and China equity team. Thank you very much. So let's go straight to the topic. I mean, is now the time to invest in China? There's a lot of... Uh, talk about China, there is uh, very much opposition, opinions differ very much, there's those who say no way, now is COVID, uh, they have the lockdowns, no way to invest there, the, the regulator gets harder on companies, and there's the other ones, they say, well, China has opportunities now, for example, now uh, making contracts with Russia, getting cheap oil, and now actually is the time to invest in China, also because uh, stock prices prices have come down considerably. So, Alice, if I ask you first, is now the time to invest in China and why? Uh, I mean, yes, the macro looks bad, but that's the kind of time and opportunity where you get uh, the chance to buy really, really good companies. And I think in China, you have some of the best uh, technologies, uh, some of the best, um, you know, um, uh, management teams that are fueling a lot of important transitions in the world in terms of AI, uh, clean energy, and, uh, you know, if you have a three to five year horizon, this is actually definitely the time to buy. So Alice is saying that, uh, well, it, it looks bad, and uh, often it is when it looks bad and uh, the bears are around, uh, it's uh, probably not the worst time to invest, right? If yeah. uh, everything bad is already in the stock prices, it's a good time to buy because there's only positive surprises in the future. What do the other panelists say? Are you agreeing? Uh, par partially, yes. Um, I'm, but there, I would put it slightly in a different light. Um, there's a massive crisis in China, no doubt. You have a COVID crisis, you have the American crisis, you have a Ukraine crisis, you have the real estate crisis, and it could go on and on. Crisis is always the best time to invest, as we know, if you're smart enough to do what. So the timing, though, as now COVID really starts, and it will spread out the country, and we will see many, many more lockdowns, and the supply chain within China will break down, and the supply chain of the world will break down, that will increase our prices, inflation rate of 7.3% with today, today is still low. I almost would bet that we go beyond 10%. So it, 
So I personally would wait a little bit today to invest, but that still means that I'm super bullish in the midterm and in the long term. Midterm in China is always shorter. The half time in China is much shorter than everywhere else. So midterm might well be end of toward the autumn of this year. And then it's a super time to invest. Wow, now I'm uh, tempted to call my broker and sell all my stocks because that sounded really scary. What's happening in the next few months? <laughs> What do you say? Um, so I think, yes, now is the time to invest. And the reason being that from an economic perspective, conditions may deteriorate in China. So obviously we've seen uh, a significant outbreak of COVID in Shanghai. I think uh, one of the things that's important to bear in mind is that the Chinese authorities will learn significant lessons from the way that the COVID outbreak was handled in Shanghai. Essentially, there was a mix of the zero COVID policy or dynamic zero COVID policy along with living with COVID. And that absolutely was not a successful policy. So I think the lessons are being learned in particular when you look at the way that the latest outbreak is being dealt with in Beijing. So I think there's a, the valuations are extremely cheap in China at the moment. You have the Chinese equity market trading around 10 times earnings. So it's very cheap. And I think economically, things may deteriorate. However, I think we've seen the worst of the COVID impact in terms of the um, in terms of the way that the situation was handled. Um, so a lot is discounted into Chinese stocks at the moment. There are also two events that I think are very important, um, which give you some optionality, I think, especially given how cheap the Chinese equity market is. One, we're expecting to see a new vaccine, a new Chinese vaccine being brought to market potentially around July. We don't know the exact details, but it is likely to be an mRNA vaccine. So this will be China's first mRNA vaccine, and that will be very, very important for the way that COVID is dealt with. It's extremely difficult at the moment to, to sort of implement the, uh, uh, the living with COVID policy that, that I see evident in this room today and I see evident in, in London, in China, because the vaccines are less effective. But that potentially could be a game changer. And then secondly, of course, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but we have, very importantly, we have the five-year meeting of the Chinese Communist Party coming up in the autumn. And I think it's going to be imperative that COVID is under control and that the economy is in a decent, decent shape. So I think you've got two very important catalysts there playing into very cheap valuations. So I heard one thing that I heard uh, uh, fundamentally, the stock price, the, the, the price earnings ratio is about 10. I heard that like a few months ago about another country. The country's name is Russia. It was very cheap, but it got cheaper, much cheaper. What uh, is uh, UBS, uh, the biggest bank in Switzerland, <laughs> saying to the topic, is now the time to invest in yeah, China? I, I, I think, yeah, well, I... Uh... I think there is no, from my perspective, there's no perfect time to invest. But uh, the case for China is uh, you need to be invested in that area and you'd rather add when valuations are low, as a couple of panelists have made that point, right? Um, and the perfect time to invest is only clear with the benefit of hindsight, right? Now, China is facing a few headwinds right now, and that has brought uh, valuations down to, uh, you could see a lot of these headwinds are discounted in prices. I'm not sure all of them are necessarily are because some uncertainties are still there, particularly, for example, how these COVID related lockdowns play out and what impact they have on inflation and supply chain. We're not sure. So it makes it a bit difficult to predict the near term course for markets, which was referred to as the next few months. Um, so I, I'd be hesitant to say, uh, you know, make a make a prediction for the next few months. But keep in mind one thing that this is the second largest market in the world. This is the largest second largest market in terms of IPOs, VCs, and PC, uh, private equity industry, either the largest or the second largest, depending on how you look at it, and the largest number of science, engineering, and technology graduates, right? So it is, from our perspective, uh, the, one of the largest opportunities for active management, right? And so, yes, I would still make the case for the medium to long term. I really can't say if this is the perfect time and what the next three to six months will bring. So I take this uh, statement of yours in hindsight. Uh, market timing is always difficult. I mean, to know when to invest is difficult. Afterwards, uh, everyone is uh, smarter. But uh, you know it or what? Can I, can I ask a question? You can uh, afterwards ask a question. Uh, uh, if you can tell us if now is the time to invest, then you make your statement. You, you know that? You know it? Yes. And uh, the risk with the ADR, especially that America is uh, putting this under the microscope. So I would like to hear your opinion on that. We come back to that later. Uh, it, it's a good point. It's a good point. The, the whole point of uh, Chinese companies being uh, quoted in, uh, uh, in, in the US, and there was a lot of. Uh, 
stuff that went wrong, right? So, but let's go and say, mm, uh, fundamentally, uh, it, it looks cheap. Uh, uh, if we have time, like, let's say five years, and uh, our... Uh, the public here is, is, is ready to invest and say, hey, yes, we have money and we want to invest it in China over the next five to ten years. And now the question, what should I buy? I mean, should I buy the whole market or is there something that you would prefer and other things that you would avoid? Alice? Uh, yeah, I think China is entering into a new kind of growth regime. It's going to be a lot slower. You're going to have to stock pick. It's not going to be the same stocks that uh, worked in the last decade. For example, I would be a structural seller Baba. I think that stock is like a, like a, everything in that company is going wrong. And uh, it's like vultures descending on a corpse is my, uh, is my uh, uh, interpretation of what's going on at Baba. Um, you know, it went X growth, Tencent went X growth, PDD went X growth, fourth quarter. You know, go, you can go into internet, Buy internet stocks, they're really cheap, but look for the ones that are growing. Look for the sectors that are growing. You know, this is not going to be your everything is growing environment in the uh, last 10 years. Um, stock pick, it's, the benchmark is not going to look the same in five years. Which ones, uh, can you uh, tell some names? Have, do you have some names that you would say these are the, the ones that you pick? Yeah, I mean, uh, firstly, like sectors, uh, you know, the, the things that we're seeing accelerate right now because of COVID, the zero COVID, is that we're seeing autonomous driving accelerate because that's how a lot of people are getting fed right now. Meituan has autonomous drivers <coughs> driving cars on the road, and that's really interesting. The, the impetus for that was not, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, consumers driving. It was logistics, right? Uh, we're seeing autonomous uh, uh, automation speed up. Um, so uh, Innovins is a company that uh, helps uh, factories automate. You know, these are the ways that China will deal with if they continue to hold this zero COVID regime, right? So these are the very clear themes right now. Then in the longer term, of course, you have global themes like, for example, I think China will, uh, you know, will uh, lead the wave of deflation in healthcare costs across the world uh, because they can create similar drugs at very, very low prices that are equivalent to the U.S., right? So a lot of these healthcare companies in China can go global in ways that uh, U.S. companies cannot because they can't arbitrage prices. Um, and then, um, you know, and, 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 and clean energy, which, which China will build for the whole world um, and infrastructure for the whole world. So those are kind of the themes. Um, we can talk about names later or in person, but yeah, themes. So I take uh, autonomous, uh, healthcare, and uh, new energy. Uh, are these the sectors that you would pick as well? Yeah, well, yeah, and, and, and stock pick in sectors that people don't like, like internet. You know, internet's not dead. You know, the most interesting thing about all of this stuff is the Chinese government has said, oh, we want to support small, medium enterprises, Xiaoju, and we want to support little giants, and we hate the internet companies. But look what's happened. 14,000 small gaming companies have died in the last six months, right? So who's going to benefit? The large internet companies, right? So, so would, that's the contrarian. You would invest in the large internet companies, I would, still, I would still say, with the Alibabas and... and, and, and uh... I would say look at actually what's fundamentally happening and not the rhetoric of the government and stock pick. So uh, there will be a lot of survivors that will get a premium in the next 10 years because of everything that's happened in the last year. You want to be with those and then you want to stick with the companies that uh, have tailwinds, like we mentioned. So you say a dog, a, do a dog that barks doesn't bite. So the regulator in China is very allowed, but uh, in the end, uh, the big companies will stay big and they will prosper. Oh, no, it has had a bark. No, you saw what happened with Baba and Tencent. It's not that it's, it's not. That it's not. And, and by the way, like, we have to also watch what the U.S. is doing, right? Uh, the ADR point, I think, is valid, right? You have to watch what the U.S. and China are doing. But on below that, there is going to be real survivors. And those guys will get reap all the benefits of no capital going into internet anymore. Who has foreign appetite? Who has appetite to invest in like another JD logistics system, right? And then and then and and all the small companies have died. So so those are the survivors. Those are your contrarian picks that you can go with. The JD logistics, for example. What do you think? Is she right or is? I mean, the, I think there's a vast agreement that you should not invest in an index in China. Why? Let's take the CSI 300. 
70, 80 percent of the index are state-owned enterprises. And over, if you look at the history, state-owned enterprise has not earned cumulative any money over the last 20 years. And if a company doesn't earn money, you better don't invest. So take out, this is one of the countries where the, the index is really a bad thing to do. I think this is important to, therefore stock picking in China is indeed um, uh, the name of the, of the game. You have headwind and tailwind industries, defined by regulations, defined by the five-year plan, defined now of the, the, the COVID situation. And I would like to give you three examples where I would invest today in tailwind industries, industries that are supported by the government, where we don't expect too many regulations. This is uh, electric vehicles, so I would say alternative energy at vehicles. Don't never forget, forget hydrogen. China's further, far ahead in hydrogen, much further than we think. In electric vehicle, I could think about a company like Xpeng, uh, which is an interesting company to look at. Be aware that these valuations are pretty high today, but it's a strong company. I would, in, I would go into the battery business. The CATL is a well-known company, but it is by far the market leader, and electric vehicle will go through the roof or continue goes through the roof. And I would go for renewable uh, energy, uh, and like Chinji Solar is an attractive company, solar panels, uh, global market leader. So g these are just three examples in tailwind industries, um, which I think are very attractive. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you did take notes. He mentioned spe specifically three companies. Yeah, so I can, I can build into one theme that I think dominates everything else. Um, and since you asked the question in a uh, five-year time frame, I think it's good to, to look at the long term. When you look at the long-term strategic imperatives for China, China has a challenge, a demographic challenge, as a result of the one-child policy, which is that the <coughs> workforce is going to start to shrink, not just as a percentage of the total population, but in absolute terms. So China is expected to lose around 100 million workers from the workforce over the next decade. And if we think that growth is a function of the size of the workforce and productivity, that means that productivity is absolutely essential to the growth of China. And I think this is something that's very well recognized in the five-year plan. So therefore, I think areas like digital infrastructure are going to be incredibly important. I do agree with the panelists around green technology, where we think the whole value chain is interesting, all the way from lithium producers, all the way to electric, manufacturer, electric vehicle manufacturers, but also trying to deal a, uh, um, drill a little bit deeper into the supply chain. So for example, manufacturers of solar inverters. Um, also, I think medical innovation is going to be incredibly important, but essentially industries that can enhance productivity are strategically incredibly important for China. So uh, you say, well, the population is, is not growing anymore and uh, there will be problems to find the workers that in China were usually to be found. So there is a lot of uh, investment going into automation. And also, of course, if with an aging population, there's more uh, money uh, going into healthcare. Uh, what's your opinion at UBS? <laughs> Problem of going last is I don't have too much new to add on top of what has already been said. I completely agree with the, uh, one, one statement, for, for, in fact, from each of the panelists, uh, starting with the f um, first one, first statement made is there is a paradigm change in how you would invest. I'm not saying it's a complete shift, but there is a change in how you would look at investing in China for the long term now, as opposed to how you have made money perhaps over the last 10 years. And a few examples were given, but you need to now be a little bit more cognizant of what the long term objectives of China's government is. Things like security, uh, things like, uh, you know, uh, clean environment, uh, common prosperity. Um, demographics. These are things that you have to keep in mind when you invest. Of course, you have to choose companies with sound business models and valuations, but you also have to keep the long-term objectives of China's government in mind. And so, some of the other areas which are mentioned by the other panelists, including the very good point about productivity uh, having to uh, come from other areas and not a rising labor, labor force anymore, plays in the hands of areas like automation, and uh, healthcare, of course, was mentioned. I mean, we, I would have said healthcare automation if you would ask me first. Semiconductors, financial services are other areas for the long term. Now, I don't necessarily mean that these are the stocks that we necessarily have in the portfolio, all of these right now. I'm saying these are areas that if you had to invest for the next five years, you would be looking at and perhaps add to add the appropriate price points. We have some of them. We don't have some of them. But these are areas we are doing more work in, right? So 
automation, healthcare, broad consumption, semiconductors, financial services are all uh, interesting areas. And yes, clean energy and environment. Okay, fine. So we now talked about where to invest. And uh, of course, all of you have some interest because uh, you have funds that invest there. So it's easier to pick areas where to invest, but more important is what should we avoid as investors in China? Uh, uh, coming back to the question that uh, came from the crowd already, I did an interview like years ago already with Carson Block from Muddy Waters. He's a short seller. He exposed several Chinese fraud companies in uh, big, big, multi-billion uh, fraud companies in, uh, in China. And uh, he's actually saying we should delist all the companies from foreign exchanges because this is basically all of them are fraud. Is there an issue, Alice, with, uh, with uh, companies out of China that list in foreign stock markets? Uh, uh, how much fraud is there? How much is there real business? Uh, or are there other areas that you would avoid as an investor in China? Well, I wonder if he's ever been to China because I mean, those companies that are listed in the U.S., a lot of them are some of the highest quality ones. You know why? Because these Chinese companies, they're trying to hire people, right? It's a very competitive environment. And if you're trying to hire, for example, engineers in the U.S. or lure, you know, uh, you know sea turtles back, the best place to be listed is in the U.S. Because you can say, we're a U.S. listed firm. That's fantastic PR for your company, right? That's why historically all the best Chinese companies wanted to list abroad. Not only for that, the prestige, but also for liquidity for capital. It makes it easier for them to get capital access. It makes it easier for them to raise capital. Um, all of the above is why some of the highest quality companies are listed abroad. Now, I would caveat this uh, with the question that the gentleman asked is, um, uh, I do think ADRs are a risk, not from the Chinese side, because actually, surprisingly, a few weeks ago, I don't know if you remember this, but the Chinese actually gave room. They agreed that the U.S. could come and, or they, start, they, they said they would agree for U.S. to come and inspect uh, Chinese companies at any time. And this is actually really unfair to the Chinese because the Germans and the French don't have to do this. The Germans and the French uh, have an agreement with the U.S. that they need to give approval before the U.S. comes and inspects. But the Chinese have actually said, okay, you know what, Pre previously we wanted the same terms as everyone else has, but now we're going to give in because we want to, you know, keep, stay, listen, we want to de-escalate. Right now it's the U.S. that's escalating, and that's a big question mark that I have over the ADRs. I don't think there's anything you lose from transferring your shares to Hong Kong, so why don't you do that, right? Um, but, you know, as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, avoid, uh, you know, it, there, there is a little bit of a Scylla and Charybdis um, maneuver that we need to be doing with Chinese uh, uh, equities, right? Because there are really, really top tech in China that's targeted, unfortunately, by U.S. regulators, right? Like the Cato company he mentioned before. I love that company, but Biden specifically mentioned that company as a company that's threatening to the U.S., right? So if there's like sanctions on that company, then you buy it. That's your buying opportunity. But some of the top tech companies in China are, are at risk from the U.S. So let's Keep that in mind. The second thing is keep in mind the companies that are really under not just regulatory pressure in China, but uh, you know uh, competitive pressure, right? And we're talking about like I just said, Baba. I think Baba is like a no go because it's not just regulatory pressure; it's TikTok, and TikTok is a, a threat to Facebook too. It's a global threat, right? So there's uh, there's there's these kinds of companies that you need to uh, avoid, and that you need to do your fundamental work. So Alice is saying, well, the real risk is not regulatory risk from China. It's risk that uh, the U.S. is uh, is trying to protect uh, the own market and uh, 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 yeah. the competition. I think the regulatory risk from Chinese government is largely over. Um, I mean, the brunt of it was last year. Right? There were a lot of thesis changes. I think the regulatory risk now comes from the U.S. So that's something to watch this year uh, and going forward. But then, you know, the, the, the risk now is that, you know, as always, China is a very, very competitive place. There's a lot of very competitive, fast-growing businesses like TikTok, and they're really threatening to a lot of um, sta standing incumbents uh, who have already gone through a tough time through regulation. Uh, so those are the two things that I would watch. Thank you. What about it? Uh, are you agreeing? Uh, the real risk is uh, US, US uh, regulatory environment and competition, or 
How, what, what's your opinion on, on China? And uh, I mean, the saying here is more uh, leaning towards, well, China is the risk. When I see through all the investors that I talk to, what's your opinion? I mean, there are two buckets where we would today um, decided not to invest. The one bucket are the headwind industries. We said they're tailwind industries. I gave you some examples, and they're headwind industries. And the headwind industries, we decided basically to get out or to invest very uh, sort of focused, in a very focused way. Headwind industries are real estate, you know, what happened to Evergrande. The, the return rate in the real estate industry went down from 30% to 2% to 3%. So this is the net present value crashed. We, you should not invest, if there is an investable company at all in any crypto, because this is, uh, will never be uh, opened up. We don't invest in fintech, because fintech is still at the beginning of the regulation. Uh, so the, the industries that are overregulated and the industries that are, will still be a bit more regulated, healthcare, I somehow disagree to the arguments around healthcare. Healthcare is an industry that will be more regulated in the future. Why? They already announced price caps for medicine because there is the common prosperity, the three mountain principle. They try to reduce the out of pocket expenses of the population. Healthcare is a big expense factor. It will be centralized uh, healthcare distribution, medical, medication distribution, and price will be capped. So that will be an area where I would be, I wouldn't say no, but I would be very careful. Now back to the ADRs. Um, it is a very sensitive and emotional topic, and, and I think we heard this already a bit, where both sides um, have their, their takes. We decided to get out of ADRs. Not that there won't be ADRs, so N-listed, New York-listed companies. Not that there won't be very attractive uh, Chinese-listed companies in the future. The fittest will survive, and the companies who are still there in three years are very attractive companies. But, you know, the way there will be painful, and we said there are so many attractive investment opportunities in tailwind industries, why doing the hassle? So we completely stepped out. But don't forget with the ADRs, the majority of the Chinese companies listed in Hong Kong are also not direct investments, right? So you're not avoiding the ADR problem but by moving out of New York. Um, you still have this if you continue being invested in Hong Kong. But I agree with you. It is, it is not that a big of a problem, but we don't know exactly what will happen. Therefore, we made a clear-cut decision on this. What do you think? Um, <clears throat> so I think with this sort of idea that there, that there are good or bad um, sectors in China, I think that very much depends on your perspective. Um, so obviously, there have been a lot of challenges in the mega-cap tech companies. That is largely reflected in valuations of, of some of the companies that we've been talking about. So there's always a question of how much you're actually playing, paying for the value <laughs> Of those businesses. So I think the lens through which you view the world really determines whether there are, there are sort of good or bad areas, if we can put mm -hmm. it that way. Um, I think one of the lessons that perhaps has not been learned yet by many investors in China, which I think distinguishes China quite significantly from a lot of developed markets, is that there have been very significant challenges, challenges to the sort of traditional growth approach to investing in China. And, and a lot of that sort of paradigm is based around companies with very high growth rates and some sort of moat. And in particular, I mean, there's, no, there's no better moat than having a natural monopoly or, or having very high market power, very high returns on, on invested capital in, uh, in, uh, in your business. Um, one of the challenges there, I think, is that there's been an interesting deviation in terms of the way the Chinese regulators have viewed the market from the U.S., which obviously, in, the, in, a, in a sort of in the interest of common common prosperity, is to try to rebalance where profits go, essentially. So I think the share that's going to go to labor versus the share that goes to capital is being diminished quite intentionally in China. And you see this best, the best uh, poster child for this, I think, would be the education space, actually. And you can also you know, put internet um, stocks up there as well. So, I mean, I'll sort of put our, our cards on the table. We are interested in the companies that are improving the most, not necessarily the companies that already have high growth and some sort of moat, because you've seen those moats being very significantly challenged. So in terms of areas to avoid, I think um, 
you know, large cap internet is going to continue to be, to be challenged because of the risk of any sort of market power coming back. I think companies that do not serve common prosperity, that don't serve productivity objectives, I think at best can be challenged, at worst potentially could, uh, I could see a further erosion of capital. So it very much depends on the lens through which you view the world. Um, I'm uh, turning to the screen so that I ask you a question. I mean, you're always uh, lost, so I don't want that you always have <laughs> the last spot. I, I give you another question. So... I heard the, the common prosperity now several times, and uh, this is like a project of China uh, that they want to redistribute re re uh, income more uh, also to the poor ones. So they would have more income and they could afford more. I did talk to the chief investor of Invesco, and he told me that he's buying some companies like Huazu, a hotel company, which is a quite a, a cheap one that could be afforded. So he's playing this, this theme of the common prosper, prosperity. Uh, is this something that you consider as well at UBS? Uh, as an 100%, investment scene? As I said, uh, we have put an additional lens or a stronger lens on our stock picking by looking at what the what the longer term objectives are. And one of those objectives are common prosperity. There's others that I mentioned, right? National security, dual circulation. But common prosperity is a very good one in the sense that it is, while it has challenged some companies over the last one year in terms of regulations, it also uh, is, is a positive in terms of other companies, particularly in the area of mass and broad consumption, upgradation from uh, low to mid to slightly higher end consumption and not just the higher end luxury uh, consumption right so yes uh, sp you know areas in sportswear areas in uh, in dairy production uh, could be uh, interesting areas to uh, to be in in terms of uh, i still like to comment on uh, you know things to avoid i completely agree that even where there are challenges to sectors you can find companies that have a sound business model and doing well. And on, on the other side, sectors with tailwinds, uh, you can have companies at very high valuations or doing well because there's some positive policy support and every company in the sector does well for a while. Money chases it, but they're not all going to succeed. So you have to uh, look at the individual business model. You have to look at in the current environment, uh, balance sheet has become even more uh, important and there the property sector comes into play uh, because a lot of them have very high debt and that's not really a great thing in this environment. Also cash flows and profitability. Investors earlier were perhaps a little bit quite willing to pay for future cash flows and profitability. That is much more important to see not too far in the future, right? So these things become more, um, more important and one has to keep an eye on valuations. But yes, common prosperity is certainly something that we are uh, you know, looking at when we are uh, evaluating the stocks in our portfolio. And lastly, in terms of uh, avoiding some areas, probably be a little bit careful of areas uh, to do with this uh, geopolitical issues. Um, could be a company which is exports a lot um, and, and or is in a very sensitive area. Uh, which could get sanctioned for right or wrong reasons. Those are areas we are a little bit more careful of. The company might be fine, but we're trying to reduce these geopolitical and factor risks in the portfolio uh, as well. So something to be mindful of. Yes. Before I open the panel for questions from, uh, from you, uh, a last question to Alice, because this uh, common prosperity is something that interests me quite uh, yeah. heavily, because all over the world, uh, if you look at, at pre-COVID, there was none person on this planet to having more than 100 billion uh, uh, in wealth mm. pre-COVID. Now there's 10 people having more than 100 billion. So the difference between the poor and the rich has as Piketty says, and his data do show that, has, 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 has widened. So uh, now comes China with this uh, project of common prosperity. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's BS. Like, <laughs> the, the, the worst thing they've done for common prosperity is the zero COVID policy. Because you know what? Nobody can work. Nobody yeah. can get anything done. You, nobody can stay in hotels. So we don't have, we basically don't have consumption because from last year we were like, actually, you know, common prosperity is a sideline thing. It's zero COVID is the biggest thing. And zero COVID destroys small businesses. So how do you get, you know, people to become 
wealthier if you don't have small businesses. So I think it's like complete BS. And uh, and um, you know, interesting fact is that last year, like mid years, common prosperity was mentioned 17 times in a speech given by Xi Jinping. Earlier this year, in February, it was mentioned only once. So they are also realizing that maybe they're like they need to downplay it. So firstly, I don't, I don't doubt that like common prosperity is something that they want to like say as a rallying call, but look at what's actually happening, right? Look at the companies that are actually functioning. Like who's actually getting food to everyone in Shanghai? It's JD and Meituan, it's the community buying stuff that like they tried to stamp out last year, right? Like these are like, so, so this is what I mean, like there is so much you know, dissonance between what the government says and what's actually happening, and then the consequences of their policies, right? And uh, it's really frustrating. So I, I agree with you. I think actually the biggest beneficiaries of, of, of COVID are uh, the, the, the introduction, the, 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 the exacerbation of inequality. And we're only seeing that continue in China. So, you know, it's kind of binary. We need to see what happens with zero COVID. Um, as um, uh, this gentleman mentioned, I do think that a lot of lessons have been learned from Shanghai. And we may, uh, an upside surprise, maybe we may not see the same situation elsewhere. But for sure, what the Chinese government is focusing on, what they've always focused on, is supply side. Uh, it's not the consumption side. I haven't seen like significant vouchers. And by the way, like who's uh, you, if you give vouchers for refrigerators, which is what they're doing, the rich people don't need the vouchers, and the poor people don't have money to buy a refrigerator, even if you give them a voucher, right? So like, how does that stimulate? No, they're just going back to the old playbook of infrastructure, supply side. You know, keeping supply chains. Uh, the priority is keeping workers employed, sleeping on cots in the factories and closed loops, so that the supply chain can stay online. That's the Chinese playbook, and it hasn't really changed. Wow, thank you, Alice. Very strong opinion, uh, and uh, contrary to what is uh, uh, sought here, uh, and uh, very interesting insight. So I open up the panel for questions. Uh, yes, in the man in the back. There's always talks about uh, China invading uh, Taiwan. How do you perceive the risks? That this could happen is that out of question now uh, with the war we have in Europe and the cooperation between Russia and uh, China and of course uh, benefiting and establishing a new payment system. How do you see what will happen in the future and will when will uh, opinion uh, come to the positive and uh, will, people will realize that China is a cheap and a prosperous place to be. Thank you. So basically, is there a new block uh, building China, uh, Russia, and Russia is just uh, the forefront with invading Ukraine, uh, that uh, China can have a look into what's happening in the world if such an invasion would go to Taiwan? And do they uh, now get together and build this payment system though, so the West cannot interfere anymore with sanctions like they do and try to do now. Who has, who has an opinion on that, a strong opinion? I Please. do, but I don't want to yes. take up too much time. No, <laughs> strong opinion, okay. let's do it. Okay, so on Taiwan, I think Ukraine significantly de-escalated Taiwan. The other thing you have to consider is that the demographic picture in China is really bad. I mean, not just the fact that the population is declining, but if you look at the structure, a single family structure means that you have one son with like four grandparents, uh, two, kid, uh, two parents, right? And probably a lot, I mean, but think about it. Like you can keep Chinese people locked down for an, a month or two and they're not gonna protest. But you have a protracted war where you tell them their kids, their only son is going to die. <laughs> try, try having a war that lasts longer than three days. You know, and uh, uh, and so so that's the first question. The second thing is that I have heard from pretty good intel that I have in the um, pol politics that um, that Taiwan has missiles directed at the Three Gorges Dam. So if the if if there was an invasion, basically what happens is they could achieve nuclear impact level without using nuclear weapons because the Three Gorges Dam would immediately flood all of the plain of China and it would throw off the uh, like axis of the world by three degrees. 
So like that is the deterrence that Taiwan has. And on top of that, it's infinitely harder to do an amphibian assault on an island country than you know, have a year to surround a country that's your, on your border with 200,000 troops and nobody even like, considers that they might be trying to invade Ukraine, right? <laughs> so, uh, so that's the first question. Um, um, uh, I'll let someone answer, else answer the second question, but just very quickly, is like I think it's B, I, I think it's total BS. Like the U.S., uh, you know, making up all this stuff about China supplying uh, Russia with military weapons because, like, it's totally preposterous. In the history of that relationship, Russia has only supplied weapons to. Uh, China. China can't even like build proper submarines. Like they sent submarines to Thailand without engines because they can't build them themselves. Like they need the Germans to build engines. So you think like you think that like the, the Russians would rely on China for weapons? Like that's totally crazy. Okay. So thank you very much. That's very good. Does someone else uh, have something? I mean, to I, add? I agree with Thailand. Look in the history. China has never started a war. Never. Right? And it's not a war country, it's an economic war country. And uh, if there would be a war, China has two objectives. The one is keeping social, uh, avoiding social unrest, and second, becoming the global economic market leader. A war would basically destroy both of these uh, primary objectives. So I don't think about it. But we still, the world would still do a good thing finding a solution around. Taiwan. Nobody wants to hang this issue, let's call it issue, for the next 50 years in. And we have to find a solution between the US and China to, to find a solution. Uh, the long, neither the US nor the China has the semiconductor capabilities like a, TM, TM, T, a TSMC. Um, nothing, nothing, I'm guaranteeing nothing was happen. With Russia, um, uh, China hates it, this war. You know, it, it doesn't win anything. It is a bit on the side of Russia, but we'll, I don't know whether they, the foreign minister made some weird statements, but let's see what the statements will be, because if they make a positive statement to Russia, they will get sanctions. They, they hate sanctions, because this will, again, reduce their GDP growth. Uh, so I'm not concerned with the payment system. Yes, of course, the payment system, the SWIFT alternative is there, and they, this will accelerate now the situation. Of course, they will have their own system. We will have two hemispheres in the future. We have a U.S. hemisphere, with technologies with uh, geo context, with payment system, etc., and we have a, a Chinese hemisphere. And that is, of course, one of the steps to create these two hemispheres. Thank you very much. I have to watch the time. Unfortunately, it was very interesting, I thought, uh, uh, but uh, it's already, we're already three, four minutes over. And uh, it was very interesting, uh, very strong opinions, very interesting. Uh, also, we had three names, specific names that uh, are, you could invest if you did take notes. Otherwise, uh, panelists are here still, so if you want to, uh, approach them, uh, ask them your questions. Uh, um, and uh, I'm sure they're happy to answer all your questions. I don't know uh, how the technical thing would work uh, with uh, UBS, if you're still here, if you can be approached as well. But uh, the others that are physically here, uh, please come forward and ask them your questions uh, personally. Thank you very much uh, for listening and uh, have a good day. Thank you very much.